What is up, everybody? Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. As always, I'd like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. I'm the host of Epic Conversations, and this is the place for Epic Conversations. And I am the 2018 recipient of the Innovation Award from the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. But it's not about me. It's about wonderful, wonderful people like the two ladies I have here, who I have not really had together since <laughs> October or November of last year. Like, it has been a while. But the reason is they have a lot of positive stuff going on. And even when I'm not around them, I brag about them to other oh. people. <laughs> so they are absolutely wonderful. Before we go any further, I'd like to say shout out to Deborah D. Hold on here. Leadership lady. Thanks, Deborah, for jumping in. You need to listen to this conversation and you also need to hang out with these ladies, at least digitally. We're going to just inter get them introduce themselves first and we're getting into a very important conversation. So first up, I'd like to say welcome as always, Dr. Tachi. How are we doing? Fine, sir. And you? I blessed, highly favored, magnet for miracles, solution for someone's problem. What yes. what say you? Uh, should I introduce myself? Is that what you Absolutely want? Absolutely okay. do that. So my name is Dr. Tatachi Egwu. Egwu is actually spelled E G W U. So yes. I know it's it's yeah. So in case yeah. anybody's looking, it's E G W U. Yeah. And um I am a media professor, a media content producer, a filmmaker, and a journalist. And I talk about all of those things. And I do that on Mediascope on Wednesdays, which is a live stream show where we talk about media tech and pop culture. Yeah, and you had a great conversation tonight. I did. I did with um, Jamie Bowles from WJMS. Yes, a warrior princess. Yes, yes, indeed, indeed. Good stuff. And the lady who's got the lovely curly locks. Well, both ladies are curly tonight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and also we, we always have a mind meld even when we don't know it. That's how connected I am with this yes. woman. Okay. <laughs> the, the, the hair thing and the ear the earrings earrings game always, always. the earring it's game is always there. on point. Yes. So yes. Truth, truthfully. So Miss Leah, do share yourself with yes. the audience. Hello everyone, I am Leah World Traveler, also known as Encyclopedia Brown, also known as <laughs> Leah Miller. Um, I'm gonna carry those titles into 2019, into the new year. At Leah World Traveler, I'm a freelance writer and blogger and speaker, and I talk about um, child and family dynamics. I'm a licensed clinical social worker. Um, by day, I'm also a diplomat, so I know a lot about foreign policy, um, though I tend not to talk about that because I'm more interested in talking about more interesting things. Um, I also talk a lot about what's going on in the African diaspora and specifically the African American community as things are happening. I'm also a travel writer, so I do a lot of writing for a black urban travel magazine called Griot's Republic. I occasionally write about health and wellness for Heart and Soul magazine, and I've been doing a lot of freelancing in 2018, and I hope to continue doing that in 2019. Um, I'm also doing a lot of speaking engagements around the same topics, um, and I have a social enterprise on the side, but we can talk about that another time. Um, but you can look for me across social media at Leah World Traveler. And uh, do tell us about the uh, a weekend you just had. Oh gosh. Um, okay, so if um, if you don't know now, you' about to know that there is this amazing group called um, TSP, um, and that is, I think, oh my God, I forgot what the T stands for. But anyway, I think it's um, Shift and Planning. I don't know. I can't remember right now. Actually, I have it right here. Traffic sales and profit. That's what it is. I'm thinking about TSB for my government thing, and it's totally different. It's my 401k. So anyway, <laughs> traffic sales and profit is an amazing group of individuals that come together, pulling together entrepreneurs in the African-American community, but in the African diaspora who are focusing on a wide variety of um, things that they sell, products and services that they offer. Um, and it's bringing people who are the, the next echelon of people. They are bringing products to market. They are promoting things within the African-American and African diaspora. They are offering um, expertise and advice to people. And this was a conference basically for, for specialists to get together and hear from experts who have been very successful in their respective fields about how to basically get themselves in order. And it was called Game Plan. And I went down as a volunteer because Lamar and Ronnie Tyler, who are the creators of Traffic Sales and Profit, are also the creators of the Black and Married with Kids website, which is the largest African-American website on the on the internet for African-American families, specifically focused to 
um, marriage and and raising families. And so as a former writer for Black and Married with Kids, they reached out to all of us to see if we wanted to volunteer. And of course I said yes, because I have to take advantage of these opportunities while I'm in the United States. And I went on and and volunteered and it was really a game changer. And I gained so much knowledge, learned so much, met so many amazing people that I'm really excited to see where those connections and that knowledge takes me this year as I work a little bit more in my social enterprise, which is called Peace and Purpose. And you can find out more about that on Instagram at Shop Peace and Purpose. Wonderful. And we have a lady that's jumped in who I've known Hi. for at least 20 plus years talking. There she goes, traffic. So <laughs> Leslie Yaffa, wow. How are you? I am good. How are you guys can hear me? Yes, we can. How are you this evening? I'm good. Ready to learn from ladies. From ladies. Yay. <laughs> nice to see you, Leslie. Thank you. Nice good. to meet you. Leslie, share a little bit about yourself because you've launched a social enterprise in the last little bit. Uh, well, it's kind of been going on for 20 years, but um, I hate <laughs> I hate, I I hate self-promoting. You know already that. I, I yes, have, I do. I, I am. I'm a professor and I also am just launched a not-for-profit called the Jamaica Project. And Ooh. training and... Um, particularly in Jamaica, obviously, but hopefully in the Caribbean training. I'm also a licensed social worker. I live here. Yay, go social yeah. work. I, li I live here in Toronto and I um, travel to Jamaica often. I'm going to Jamaica to be a visiting professor at the University of the West Indies come the end of the month till the end of April. That's awesome. Yeah, so we've got it moving. Thanks. Thank you. There's so no many problem. threads that are common here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I, I used to teach in Jamaica too. So. Oh, amazing. Amazing. Oh yes. Amazing. And you so just said Caribbean, I, I, and I have I, I, family in Suriname, so we have like you know, kind of the distant relative, but we're in the Caribbean, so amazing. Amazing. Yeah. I, I feel like the least educated out of the ladies here, <laughs> oh, so I just, <laughs> I just like, I'm just, I'm just fodder right now. Everyone else is just like <laughs> the high ups here. But uh, one thing I will say with Leslie, Leslie was around when I first started this stuff way back when. I remember going to her home and just putting a microphone down and we would just chat. So Leslie's known me for a long time. Talking is good. Talking is good. Nice. <laughs> Absolutely. We got to say what's up to Curtis Brooks. Uh, so um, Leah and Tachi, mm -hmm. you wanted to approach this subject tonight. And I know that Leslie has her thoughts too about this because she deals a lot with the black community all around the world, especially in Jamaica. So I'm going to let Tachi and Leah lead. And let's say anything you want to add on to the conversation, please feel free. So let's, uh, Leah, Tachi, who wants to start first? I, th I always defer to Tachi. No, yes. Well, this was, this was your, <laughs> this was your uh, shall we say, suggestion. Sure. So I'm going to defer to you. Okay, so in 2019, it's going to be reversed, huh? Okay. <laughs> yes, well, um, just to frame the conversation. Yeah. Sure. So I'm sure by now everyone has seen the Lifetime docu-series about um, surviving R. Kelly and sort of the conversations around uh, sexual violence, sexual abuse um, of underage girls um, and some of the conversations that have come out of sort of the airing of laundry that has really not been a secret um, to us. It's just been sort of uh, put under the carpet. People have turned a blind eye to it because of the fame of, of R. Kelly. Um, and he is only one of, I'm sure, many stories that haven't been told. But what I think made me think, um, or you know, what's been triggered for me by that conversation is memories of when he was with Aaliyah. Um, I mean, I'm basically the same age as she was. She would be my age if she were still living now. And I remember feeling very uncomfortable, even at that age, knowing that they were in a relationship with one another. And fast forwarding to the present, after hearing from the voices of victims and in the era of the Me Too movement and the Mute R. Kelly and other movements that are setting victims rights and victims voices in the forefront and not something to be overlooked or disregarded i felt it was important for us to kind of not so much speak about r kelly or the docuseries but talk about the larger issues that come out of the of the documentary and and that people are now talking about much more candidly because i think half the problem is that we don't know how to have these conversations that it's very taboo that it's often hidden and because we are in a marginalized group people don't care as much, I mean, as, mad, as ugly as it is to say, it's just the truth. Um, so that's why I feel like these women for so long have been able to be victimized because no one could intervene because no one really cared. And I mean, you hear it said over and over again, not only in the documentary, but in the commentary after the documentary aired about how if this had been happening with white women, immediately something, there would have been an uproar, he would have been immediately 
prosecuted, he would have been found guilty, he would be in prison today. But because the victims were largely African American women, clearly nothing has been done. Um, and so I want to get to the heart of rather that side of things, talking about why is this such an issue that we feel we can't talk about it? Why do we not try to protect all women? Why are women, black women specifically, still considered lesser than? Why don't people care? So I sort of want to have those conversations with, with you guys tonight. Okay. Uh, Tatcha, I'll let you go next. Uh, piggyback on to what Leah says, as you always do, but also a media perspective. Definitely. In and in, from a media standpoint and a media perspective, just in terms of what you see, when it comes to this can even go back to when you talk the way conversations are framed against um, missing and exploited black women. What conversations do you hear? Nothing, almost nothing. Uh, and it goes back to the point that in the grand scheme of things, black women don't matter in the grand scheme of things. And if they don't matter in larger society, they obviously are not going to be pinpointed and uh, emphasis will not be placed on black women in the media when they are abused or when they are missing. And you know, the, I think the, the hurtful thing and the, the terrible thing is that it's not just the quote others that you ex that we would normally expect this treatment from. It's coming from the black community itself, mo both men and women from things like, okay, not to get into the, the R. Kelly thing too deeply, but things like some people not believing the women, things like, mm -hmm. and even, even women not believing the women, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and perpetrating and putting that out there that, oh, well, they, they, they was put on them. The burden of proof mm -hmm. was put on them. Never mind that R. Kelly has been trashed for years. I mean, even back as you were saying to the Aaliyah thing, that he actually married a 14 year old. And then the whole series of events of other things, he just, He's mm -hmm. just a nasty individual in the first place in terms of uh, behaviors and persona and treatment of women. So we've here's here's the other here's the other piece of it. The and I'll speak on uh, black people in the black community as far as I can. We have excused deplorable behavior and his deplorable behavior in this case because of the fact that we have this notion and this true notion that black men are downtrodden in society. And what we don't want to do is add to their burden anymore. And therefore we're going to sit and accept whatever rubbish comes with an R. Kelly because we want to cultivate and preserve his feelings. Never mind the feelings of the victims and the women in this case, but we keep doing this and we keep using this as a crutch and, and an excuse to excuse what the black community does in this case, black, uh, black men like R. Kelly have done. And this is not just, you know, in the R. Kelly public eye, let's look at, um, we could talk about, as we will later, I'm sure, the um, sexual abuse when it comes to families, when it comes to the uncle or the father or, you know, the sister. And because we don't talk about it, because we have these deep family secrets, we, t you know, we tend to hold, it doesn't get solved. And then you cultivate. Now, this is not to say that everybody who gets a user, that's not the case at all. But in some cases it does happen. And do we not think that we could have somehow intervened if we were having these conversations? So those are some of the things I want to talk about tonight in addition to what my very articulate Soror has said. <laughs> And Leslie, what about you? What do you have to say on the topic? I, I, I just get very overwhelmed by it. I, I mean, it's just so many layers. Yeah. And it keeps going back to this idea of systemic racism, systemic everything. And it's hard for me to articulate as a white woman how to break it down. And I think these conversations are really good for that piece. Because I just watch it and I'm like, <gasps> I start heaving almost because I'm like, how? Mm -hmm. Why? I mean, I'm Canadian. It's a little, I don't know, I don't know if it's any different. I don't know if the voices are any different. I don't know if the justice system is any different, but I just heave at this. And so how does it even get to this? How did it even get to this point where they're airing a lifetime special about this and nobody's been prosecuted, nobody's been brought to justice. And maybe it is, maybe you guys are right. Maybe it's cause it's black women and it is, that's the problem. And so how, how can we start the conversation that is it beyond the, 
the layers of this and is it really just systemic? You know, and, and you bring up you bring up so many interesting things. And then there's two things here. Again, I don't know how it works in Canada or what happens, but I would guess some of these um, issues are the world over because it's not just in the U.S. where this is an issue um, because the uh, the value of women tends to be so low around the world that things like these happen. And in fact, in some other cultures, if you are abused, it's seen as your fault and it's an embarrassment to your to your family. So, you know, there's this again, blaming the victim victim. So this is the world over. I, I think we've just uh, in, in this case, again, because of the fame of somebody like an R. Kelly, we've overlooked. So part of it is the fame, you know, and part of it is uh, the fact that <laughs> black women tend not to matter. Women in general don't have very high value in, in our society, but Correct. black women in particular are even less valued than everybody. It's, it's almost like we become uh, the throwaway. So, you know, Leslie, you bring up uh, some really interesting points. And to, to your point of the conversation, I think at this point we're beyond conversation. I'll say this, black people, we talk too much. Every five minutes we're having a conference, a caucus, a something, a something. And we just need, at this point, I'm tired of talk. We need action. We do need to start in some senses with the talk and the conversation, because what we have to do is pull others into the conversation. We've been having these conversations amongst, amongst ourselves, the people who are, you know, talking about this, but we need to bring other people into the conversation. But at the same time, there needs to be action. And I think part of what's starting to happen now is part of action. Okay, so I, yes, I because I'm sure you both have heard, though, that now there's more charges being brought against him and there's some investigations taking place as a result of the airing of the documentary series. And of course, he's counter suing and, and doing all these defamation and things. And, you know, he's saying, of course, he's innocent. But I do think it's leading to something and I do feel like more and more there's becoming a there's a groundswell among other famous people who have worked with him to kind of disassociate themselves and pull the collaborations that they've had with him and for venues to say no we're not going to support or host your concert here. So I'm, even though it may not be legalistic in terms of the the thing that's the things that are happening to him, he is still being negatively impacted as a result of this airing, but my it still makes me frustrated. I'm like fine, maybe he'll he'll finally be prosecuted and the, his victims will finally have some sort of justice but i don't feel like it should take 20 plus years and hundreds if not thousands of victims to get to that point it shouldn't take the airing of a docu-series it shouldn't take the fact that there's literally only one newspaper one reporter who told this story and kept telling that story for the past 20 years and finally people are listening to him because he's like i've been telling you guys this for years he was the first person that was um given a copy of the marriage certificate between r kelly and Aaliyah. And he's been on the story since then. And he's been telling that story and he's had the platform to do it. But because of the fame and because of everyone wants to like his music and they can't, they're able somehow to make a separation between the man and his actions and the music that he makes. So they still enjoy the music and then they kind of forget about the things that people are saying about him and that have been alleged against him. Um, there has been no real, you know, legal challenges to him and i think he gets emboldened by the fact that when he has been taken to court he has been charges dropped or acquitted or never never charged that stuck so then he feels like you know he's getting off scot-free so i'm clearly not doing anything wrong let me just continue absolutely and it, what i do, it, the the interesting thing is when you look at okay let's look at it in another sense i would there would probably never be and I can't, I'm not speaking for Jewish people, but I would, you would probably never see a Jewish person who would go and dance to the music of a Nazi war criminal musician. I don't know why we think <laughs> that it's okay to dance to R. Kelly's music and to support R. Kelly's music. And I'm not equating the, these two things, but it's saying that when you have um, someone who is an oppressor, why are you uh, Stockholm syndroming yourself into it? And the thing is, is we, we've, we've made it okay. And we continuously excuse and, and make up uh, reasons why. And so now the latest thing is, I think R. Kelly's brother came out and said that both he and his uh, brother and R. Kelly were um, abused by their older sister. Yeah. So yeah, we, they did say that. Right, they came out and and um and said that. So 
again, so, and I had this conversation with uh, actually Curtis earlier. You, un not this particular conversation, but what I'm about to say, you understand where it comes from. So maybe it makes sense. Again, not everybody who's abused ends up being an abuser. So, but maybe in this case, you can understand where it comes from. However, because there was such co-signing on his scandalous behavior and no aim at treatment, and I can't say no aim, I don't know for sure. I remember at one point where he professed to be saved and Kirk Franklin and all these people were trying to, to work with him. So maybe there was some effort, but not enough. But because there wasn't a, a huge emphasis on rehabilitation and reforming who he was, he continued to do you know, all of these things. And it's it's very bothersome and it's very annoying because it's like, who do you have when when, when you're a black woman and even back to the thing of this whole, I was talking about this earlier, the McDonald's situation where the young girl was, be, you feel like you have nobody to protect you, nobody. So if, if everybody is, is, you know, throwing rocks at you in terms of this is your fault, who do we really have? So now can people understand when we have some problems with the way society is? If, if there's a, such a thing as angry, did society not make us angry? Just saying. Exactly, and I want to give Leslie an opportunity to chime in, but Curtis um, was making a note in the comments and he was saying, was it not the choice of the women to go with R. Kelly? Oh, and, and I wrote back to him um, that it wasn't in all cases and that we're talking about little girls, not grown women right. who know better. We're talking about little girls that were basically he preyed upon them um, because they were enamored with him. They were seeing a star who they loved and admired. They were seeing someone who could help them achieve their dreams and goals of being singers or performers or entertainers themselves. Mm. And he turned that relationship of potentially being a musical mentor or a connector to management and to labels into a sexual domineering, totally dominating brainwashing relationship. So I don't believe that it was consensual at all. I think he took advantage of his fame, his, his position, his authority, his age, his knowledge of basically how to manipulate these girls, little girls, because that's what they are and that's what I'm gonna call them, to do with what he wanted them to do and to serve the purposes that he wanted them to serve. Um, because if it really was all about professional careers, where's their career at? Can you name one of those girls he supposedly mentored, where's their record at? Where's their platinum plaque? I don't see that. So to me, it was clearly just an opportunity to use these girls, abuse these girls for his own needs um, with nothing, you know, it was definitely not consensual. And uh, I really don't believe that the girls went in with the thought that, oh yes, I'm going to become his sex slave or I'm going to become his whatever. I'm sure they didn't go in thinking there was anything sexual connected to that relationship that he groomed over time. I also want to point out that the documentary pointed out in the beginning, they showed that after his relationship with Aaliyah was annulled and he moved on from that, he was actively hanging out at the local high school. What grown man in his late 20s, 30s hangs out at a high school? With who? No one other than predators. Yes. So to me, that answers the question. No, yeah. to me, none of those relationships were consensual. Right. Right. And I think, Leslie, I think, I, I think your point is taken, Leah. It's Leah, right? Leah? Yes, yes, Leah, hi, yeah. Hi, hi. Um, so I, I, I think the point is taken. I think there's two points. I think Tashi said, you know, um, I like your analogy. I'm Jewish. I like your analogy about about Jew, uh, Jewish people and, and this. Also, just I, I keep seeing two things. I keep seeing this idea of power, 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 this power dynamic that we get so many people of privilege, huge amounts of power so they can exploit if they want to. And that's what he did going to a high school. When I saw that, I'm like, Oh my gosh, could any anyone else go into a high school that's an adult like that and exploit? Probably not, right? Yep. And I look at this as a macro and a micro. I'm a therapist, but I'm an academic now, but I'm a therapist by trade. How do you explain this to the kids that I deal with every single day? How do you explain this on a, I understand it on a macro level. I just don't understand it on an everyday level. And so how, yeah. do, how do we break that down to make it understandable and create conversations like this with the people we deal with every single day, right? Students, Absolutely. academics, everybody. You're right. And that's part of the thing that baffles me the most. Like, it's clear to me that he's a troubled individual and he clearly is a predator. And, you know, that is one thing. But the other piece that I do not understand and, and still cannot wrap my mind around and is really at the heart of this conversation now is where were 
the whistleblowers? Where was the administrator or the teacher or the social worker or the guidance counselor that is like, why is this grown man here up in this high school every day? Why aren't we asking him, man, what are you doing here? Or do you want to do a concert? Are you going to give a scholarship? Like, what is your purpose here? Because you should not be here. And all of these people that were interviewed sees him hanging around with little girls, going to the mall, a place that little girls go to, young teenage girls go to, a 30-year-old man. And they're all like, yeah, we thought it was strange, but but I'm sorry. Yes, it's strange. You know that something is wrong. Did you question him? Did you ask him? No one intervened. And that's the part that I am having a hard time with because a predator is going to do what predators do, which is to prey on people, which is what he did. And he was left unfettered. Like there was nothing stopping him. Mm -hmm. The doors were left open for him. So I'm wondering why the gatekeepers didn't close the gate or at least question who's coming through the gate that I cannot wrap my mind around. And I, and I think, I think also the, the, that comes to the idea that, Oh my gosh, fame is more important than people. Athletic exactly. Is more, more important than people. Everything money consumption is more than people. And we saw that we saw that at uh, what is it um, Penn State. It's similar. Everybody exactly. didn't want to ruin this reputation and speak out, see something, say something. They just didn't want to do it. So that just shows me a value judgment there. It, it just it just baffles me. Absolutely, Tachi. You know, I think that uh, Kurt, uh, you made this point earlier, and then Curtis is making the point. Why did it take a documentary for the legal systems to respond? Um, I, I think that's the way we're set up. Once it gets put in the public eye, it then becomes an embarrassment. And all this comes up, like all these questions, like where were the administrators? Where were these people's parents? All these questions start to come up. But when you're not confronted with the information or you're not accused of turning your back, then it's not a problem. So it, it came out be, definitely because of the, uh, the documentary and the pressure it put on people to actually look at this. It should not have, but it's because there was no accountability before and nobody had to answer for everything. Mm -hmm. But now we're embarrassed. Now they're like, oh, well, I was connected to that and I did nothing. So it's calling people out. So you have to save face when you're called out. Now I need to be fine and upright and I need to find a way to make this right whether in you know out in society or in my own mind this is what's happening so no it shouldn't take it but often in this society that's what it needs to i mean think about all the things in terms of the the cases we see of people doing things that are wrong on it's all over social media now right whereas these mm -hmm. things have always been done they just weren't put on twitter or instagram or whatever so we we were none the wiser we were kind of the wiser with this but the documentary compiled everything into a a one what was it it's over six episodes was it yeah, yeah six episodes about an hour each so in six hours you were you were basically beat over the head with this information so you are compiling all of this now that's another thing as humans we tend to be very lazy all of this information was out there for you to research probably if you wanted to get to it so we're not going to do six hours worth of research to do it somebody else now has done it so and, and some people don't have know where to start necessarily or for them it's not a problem but now that it's put out there now it comes to the front of the public's mind so that's another thing that's why i think exactly i agree with you completely and i also think like you said it's because it's in the court of public opinion and 20 years ago when he was going through this relationship with Aaliyah, yes it was covered but not in the same way so if you weren't a fan necessarily of r&b music if you weren't really listening to things coming out of Chicago or, you know, it's if you're, it's it's also a generational thing too. So, I mean, young folks now aren't necessarily aware of what was going on back then. They know R. Kelly, but from his more recent works, the whole crazy in the closet, all that stuff. They may not know his earlier works like Aging Nothing But a Number with Aaliyah, her first album, um, which is putting it out right there. It's like hiding in plain sight, which was, which was also one of the themes of the R. Kelly uh, documentary is that He's been doing this in plain sight all of this time. People have just cho chosen to look the other way. So I feel like using social media as it is now and sort of the accessibility of being able to get it to more eyes and more people and more demographics, it's sort of bringing things to, to the level that it is at right now. And then also with the, the sort of beginning of the social movements that are done through social media, like Me Too, like all of those things that kind of bring people together in a way that we haven't seen prior to this because we didn't sort of have this shared platform of interconnections on a digital platform. Um, I think you're seeing that with the Mute R. Kelly movement. I mean, it started in real places, but it sort of got its groundswell of support and has grown as a result of social media engagement. So I do agree that's what it is. 
May I ask a question of both of you? Since we've, uh, guys, we've seemed to have lost Dr. Uh, vibe somehow. So hopefully yeah. he's on his way back in. Yeah, he messaged just a moment ago in Twitter saying that he and he wants us to keep going and he'll get on as soon as he can. He says we're doing a great job. He'll be okay. back in a little while. He needs to reboot his computer. He just says, keep on going. He knows okay. the conversation is in good hands. Um, so let's just keep moving. Oh, okay. Awesome. Awesome. Somehow I think you <laughs> did this on purpose, Dr. Vibe. Anyway, I'm kidding, but <laughs> maybe <laughs> I think I wouldn't put it past him. Exactly. So I want to ask a question of both of you. So when we look at these things, so this whole mute R. Kelly, uh, obviously the themes are, uh, not 100% the same, but echo some of what's going on with the Me Too movement, right? So the thing is, this whole mute R. Kelly, while it needs to have separate attention placed on it, it to me seems like it once again separates the movement in terms of, because I'll say this, there are so many, uh, even though the Me Too movement was really helmed by a woman of color, a black woman who started the whole concept, Black women don't feel like, and I don't want to speak for every black woman, but on the whole, when you see and you look and you research, black women tend not to feel like they are part of the Me Too movement. Like a lot of other movements, we tend, we feel like we're left out of. So do you feel that it makes sense that this is so something separate from the Me Too movement? Do you think it needs to be folded in or how, how would you handle that? What, what, why don't you think they belong, they feel they belong? Oh, because most of the time, the faces, the cases, everything mm. about these movements, it's often framed from a non-melanated point of view, meaning that usually Caucasian women are the front and the ones that are important when it comes to abuse, when it comes to these types of things. And Black women are usually always on the outs, whether it's the women's movement or et cetera, because there are things that are germane to, for example, the Black female experience that are different from the white female experience, fine. But what happens is because uh, the dominant culture is usually in charge of these movements, they look at it through the dominant culture's eyes, which leaves out everybody else, which is usually women of color in this case. So that's that's where I'm coming from with this. It, it seems yet again, there's something that could be part of the movement or if even it needs to be, but that's what I'm trying to find out from you all, whether or not you feel this is something that needs to be folded in as a strengthening of the movement or that it really needs to exist separately and on its own. And what does that do existing separately and it's on its own? Yeah, I was good. I will answer that, but I also want to just throw in that. So, so Steph said, I don't care what movement they deal with him in, put him under the jail. Yeah, yeah. And then she also said, I think the bigger issue is that because the girls were black, it was ignored. Right. Which is what we, what I, we agree. So, so Steph, we made the same point earlier is that the reason why there wasn't more, you know, of an outrage or uproar about this earlier on when we knew about it 20 years ago is because the victims were black women, black girls. Um, and only now, as Dr. Chachi said, in the aggregate, 20 plus years of abuse that's now been put together in this docuseries. Now there's general outrage because we've been able to use platforms that didn't exist 20 years ago to bring the message to, to different advocate groups and voices that have the ability to make it an issue to stick. Yeah. Um, and I think it is sort of going along with the Me Too movement. And to go back to um, Dr. Tachi's question, I don't know that it needs to be a part of the Me Too movement. I feel like they can kind of be in parallel because I do think that while they do have things that you know interweave between them and certain similar themes that they're trying to address, I think that one is specific to him um, and specific to sort of black women's advocacy advocacy for themselves by themselves. Um, and I do think that there's some purity in that, that not that it would be tainted by link, linking in with the Me Too movement, but I think that that would be distilled um, because there's a very specific goal that they're trying to achieve. And even though it does align with some of the goals of the Me Too movement, I think that their end goal is a little bit different. Okay. So I don't know that it would necessarily benefit them to join. I think they should have allies and they should work together totally and, and support one another because they do have some of the same goals at the end of the day. But I think that there's a very specific objective with the with the Mute R. Kelly movement that is a little bit different than the overarching goals that the Me Too movement have. But that's just my take on it. So, and if that's, and I, I agree. I agree um, that there should be a sub movement. But is there power in numbers? Is there power in joining? Yes. Um, and if and, and and if so, how do we do that but still keep that edge or that difference between the groups, but still advocate for one another? Because part of the problem is 
that we do separate. And I think that cracks the movement. Sure. I mean, my, my thinking is that we don't have to see each other as separate movements. I just think that we can see each other as like taking different angles to get to the same goal. So you guys focus on this part, chip away at that. If you need our support, we're here for you. We'll show up at the rallies. We'll make the calls and we're going to keep working on this side of the problem. And we'll keep focusing on that objective. And when we need you, you guys come on over and we'll work on this together. I don't think that it needs to be mutually exclusive. I feel like they can still be working in tandem on their specific objectives because there's enough cross you know, fertilization of what they're trying to do, that they can still be supportive of one another and they should totally be allies with one another and they should be in com communication with one another. I, but like I said, because they kind of have a little bit of a different aim, um, I understand why they kind of feel like they may want to remain independent of one another, but I think being open to working together should totally be an option because I, I do agree that there is power in numbers, strength in numbers. And I do think that it doesn't just need to be seen as a black woman or a black girl issue. It's an issue for all women who are abused and for all people whose voices um, are taken away from them and for all the women who have suffered from victim blaming or being in cultures or in a society that will look at them as though they asked for it or that they deserve it somehow or that, that it's their fault. Or what were you wearing? What were you doing? Were you intoxicated? No, Those are the first questions. Yeah. So I feel like there's a lot of overlap but in this case, it's with the objective of this individual. Right. And I think I think there's common things like male to toxicity. I mean, there's common themes that go through all mm -hmm. of us, right? And I think that's what the alignment yes. should happen. But again, there is obviously glaring differences in different places that need to be highlighted. It has to be. Right? Again, exactly. And I like said, go ahead. Go ahead, Leah. Sorry, Leslie. I was just gonna say, yes, I agree. And I don't I think the fear that some may have is that if they try to align forces, as I said, it may distill down what the Mutar Kelly movement is trying to do. And I also think that for the black women leaders, some of them, and I'm not speaking for them, but this is my interpretation, is that they don't necessarily feel that their specific needs are met when they join these larger movements that are not run by women who look like them. So I think there's a little bit of a resistance, and in some cases, a very big resistance to joining movements that are white female led, while yes, at the end of the day, the objective is the same, they, they look at things a bit differently. And I do think that a lot of the white women leaders believe that they're taking into consideration the needs of non-white women or their, you know, their melanated sisters, but that isn't always the case because it's an assumption that they're making without asking the question. And when you don't ask the question, then I think you, you're kind of missing the mark in terms of inclusivity. Tachi has much more to say on that though, because we've talked about this in the past. Yeah, no, absolutely. Because it's tantamount to, uh, I'm Nigerian, I'm African. And when people are always trying to do things to save Africa, the big thing is like, oh, well, we need to do this. Did you ask Africans? So that needs to, that needs to be the, the, the big thing. You need to find out what's needed. There needs to be, uh, as you were saying before, Leslie, definitely more conversations. And yes, there is strength in numbers. But what ends up happening is if you feel alienated in a movement, you don't feel like you belong, you're not going to participate in that, move, in that movement. And we, here's the thing. There are also past experiences that we've been had where, uh, for example, black women have been and black people have been used uh, as uh, a crutch in a movement and then when we're they're done with us they discard us and continue uh with the movement i mean uh Leah and I are both in an organization where social action was one of our biggest things. And we, the first uh, thing that we did when we were formed in 1913 was to participate in the women's suffrage movement. Well, clearly, we were clearly told we did, we were not wanted there. Okay. So, I mean, that this continues to happen. So you want to have our numbers, but you don't really want us to say anything about it. And so, so Steph made the, the uh, comment that, you know, the, me too movement was the hashtag that movement was started by a black woman yes yes it absolutely was but what has happened is yeah. that is not the face of the movement anymore so at the end the end Definitely. of the day it doesn't matter who starts the movement the face that you see determines the direction that the movement takes and i, I agree Taji. i i for a long time i didn't know it was started by a black woman which is what, what was it mm -hmm. i could not see any media i saw a lot of the stars or the celebrities exactly. grab onto it, but I never saw her until I actually read the Time Ma Time magazine. Right. So, yeah. And again, silence. Unrelated. Why silence? Exactly. Black women? Why are you silencing black women? That's the. I mean, that's a great question, right? Yes. And I wanted to just quickly throw in there that the founder of the Me Too movement was featured in the docu series, as was the founder of the Mute R. Kelly movement. Both of them are black women. And just to shout out my university, that's Syracuse University, the founder of the uh, Mute R. Kelly movement is also a Syracuse grad and a friend. Excellent. Oh, wonderful. 
Yeah. Excellent. A friend from back there. I mean, we're still cool, but you know, we were friends with guys. <laughs> yeah. So, but I, it goes to the point of just saying, um, what Leslie already made the point in more eloquent words than I can make is that I also don't understand sort of this, this need to have ownership of something that wasn't necessarily started by you. And then moving aside the people who had the idea and started it or not considering their voices, or as you said, it goes back to the celebrity question because now the face of the Me Too movement are white females in Hollywood who, yes, they, they have their voice and they have their stories to share and tell and they're using their, their fame and their platform for the purposes of the movement and I totally respect that and I have nothing negative to say about that. But when you think of the Me Too movement, it's them that you think of. Oh yeah, oh yeah, 100%. So that's the part where I kind of struggle a little bit and I grapple with it because I'm like, Yes, that is one narrative, and that's a story that needs to be told, and they're using their fame and their power and their influence to make sure that those messages are are shared. But I'm like, but also then, when you are making your speech, famous white Hollywoodite, please bring on the stage the founder. Let her say some and how words. And how please arrogant. bring on... And how arrogant. Who are... How arrogant. Right. And righteous is that. Right. For the exactly. Time, so that means... time, I didn't know, and I, 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 I consume. I don't live in a vacuum. I consume quite a lot of media, all different types of media. And so... If I didn't know that, then you, the everyday white woman or the white person would not know that ever. Right. And, and the average person does not know that. I still think that as much media as the founder of the Me Too movement has had, and she's, she's all over the social media, she's all over articles, she's written things, she's spoken, um, she advocates for it. I still think the average person, if they even know really what the Me Too movement is about, number one, don't realize that it was founded and organized by a black woman. Welcome back, Dr. Vibe. Well, yeah, he is I, back. I, I, why, why am I back? I don't know why I'm back. Like when you have three outstanding people, ladies on, I can just sit back and enjoy the conversation. But thank you for allowing me back. Well, we're happy that you're here. Yes. Well, I, I'm just going to share some comments now that I'm back that I've seen here. Uh, gentlemen, you foresight for you too says, I find there's a code of silence when it comes to R. Kelly. Everybody seems muted, and there was, there were responses. I don't see the anger that's associated with having a daughter trapped in that house. These families are, these families matter. A great video. No, I can't. I don't understand that part. Then Melvin Mars is saying because far too many people of color still do not value themselves. So is there an issue here, sure. of black people not valuing themselves and allowing themselves to get themselves into this? type of situation thoughts yes yeah yes i mean yeah. i feel like there's so many elements to miss to this which is what makes it so complicated it isn't so much just the the issues that we already know exist the power privilege and all of the you know the whitening and lightening of these movements that's always going to be a part of it as long as the power dynamics are what they are but we also have to be willing to acknowledge the fact that it is what you just said dr vibe is that we don't value ourselves and we don't value vulnerability and we don't necessarily have the same types of conversations with our girls. And sometimes we're even bamboozled by the hype too, that this powerful or famous or important person has an interest in me. So, you know, that makes me feel special because that person is interested in me. It's victimization. That does, That's colorblind. Um, but that sort of feeling of self-worth or lack of self-worth or, you know, feelings like you don't have value unless someone else validates you. I definitely think is is rampant in not only African Americans but people of the African diaspora globally because we've been told our entire existence that we don't matter, that we're the last on the list, that you know we're animals, that we're subhuman, and so obviously those messages have gotten ingrained. And over time, I think that they'll work themselves out. But I mean, we're only two hundred years away from slavery in the United States. That's that's really not that long ago. It's not, um, and frankly, I think it's less than that. Um, so I feel like those those that indoctrination and, and that beating out of us of our self-worth and our values and our roots and our heritage and the importance of who we are and where we come from, it's going to take a long time to get back. And what made it so successful is that they taught us to hate ourselves. They taught us to value light skin over dark skin, being in the house versus being, you know, indoor labor versus outdoor labor. And now we perpetuate those myths and stereotypes amongst ourselves. We don't even need larger society or white America or white Canada to to push those messages, we do it to ourselves. And that's the sad part. Uh-oh. That's so, not always a good sigh. No, no, you know I love the sigh when it, 
So he and, and I un, that is one hundred percent true. I agree I, as I always do with Leah. That is one hundred percent percent true. So I guess the more philosophical question is: When do we become tired enough of our condition to change our condition? We have been having this same damn conversation since eighteen sixty five, and I excuse it more in eighteen sixty five because you're like. Well, how many years away from slavery than I do now. Now, I do understand the science of the colonized mind. They do a very good job of colonizing your mind so they don't have to have somebody watching you to call it. So they, you know, they're absolved of having to do things because you've done it to yourselves now. Fine, I understand that. But there is enough out there for us to know this is the case. Where is the disconnect that something is not happening outside of things we can't control? These are things that we can start to control. And, you know, it gets a little bit tiring and and I'm frustrated with this whole thing because I'm like, OK. And what happens is and I guess that's the mentality is human nature and some that you look for a leader. We constantly look for leaders to tell us how to get and and the, the mm-hmm. movements cannot work with just a few head people at the top. They're the ones who help to keep things organized, but they need help from everybody else. So you can't just stay willfully ignorant and wait for a new Messiah to come and lead you out. This is what is starting to get on my nerves here. We sat knowing our Kelly was trash for donkey's years and did nothing. Nothing. And I'm I'm also pointing the fingers at, guess what? All these people who have now disassociated themselves with his song and his music would not have done so if this documentary did not come out. They were, uh, got Lady Gaga, uh, Celine Dion, all these people who have done music with him. Sierra. The, Sierra, they would have just- Non-Legend, like, Chance the Rapper. The, the list goes on. Nobody would have said a damn thing had this documentary not come out. So at what point do you start to be fighting upright and do we get tired enough of our own condition to change it? And it doesn't help when you have people that, that are powerful or famous at the helm not doing anything. So you know what needs to happen? With all these things that have come out, look at your relationships. If you're a person of stature and fame, look at what you're doing. Say, who do I need to cut out? What do I need to change and what do I need to stand up for? That's the only way it changes. Well, yes. the only thing I'll add on to that is, is it a, also a situation of not in my backyard? So if, because people, people are not thinking or many blocks saying, you know what? It's not affecting me directly. It's not someone that's, I know, is it a not in my backyard syndrome? Well, or, or is it, it hasn't hurt enough people for people say, you know what, let's put, let's stop right here. And now I don't know, maybe I'm just throwing it out there because oh, I also, go, ahead, go ahead. It's been going on no, go ahead, enough, and obviously what, you know, unless it hits your own family, are people just saying, you know what? I just go on my everyday life. Da, 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 da. So be it. I'm just throwing that out there. Or is it society has been set up this way? I had this discussion with my students. Has society set us all up like this? Mm. Good point. Mm. Mm. I think I, I, there was another uh, a story that I did uh, today on Mediascope where we were talking about the Gillette controversy where they have yeah. uh, the, the masculinity. The masculine, yeah. right, the toxic masculinity. Yeah. And when you look at uh, some of the tweets on Twitter by people that have blue checks now, these are not people that are just anybody. They are, you know, people of stature, etc. And they had comments to say uh, about, well, you know, well, just, you know, just sell, you uh, uh, razors. Don't worry about having social commentary. The point is that people don't like to be told when they're doing wrong and when they're not at doing any enough about people who are doing wrong. People hate to be told those types of things. And I think this is the case here. No black person wants to be told that they are not doing enough to protect their community. They get defensive and they get up in arms about it. And by saying these things about R. Kelly, that means that people who dance to his music, buy his music, turn their eye while all this thing, all these things were happening, sat idly by and did nothing. Right. While, right. And right. they right. don't want to be called out for it. That's what it is. And fr- and frankly, it made me puke in my mouth a little bit to see John Legend now come out. Like they all have his martyrdom syndrome. Like I'm going to be the martyr. I'm going to come out. And it, 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 it it's it's disgusting. Why didn't you come out five years ago? 
You all produced music, had music, were with music with him. So that is what's scary to me. That, that I, I just don't, I can't comprehend. So then we come out and everybody's praising John, John Mayer for coming out and saying that. Again, in this martyrdom syndrome, right? I'm a mm -hmm. martyr. Look, I'm coming forth. I'll risk some of my money, my gazillion dollars to come out. And I'm sorry, may, may I, uh, if I may be so bold, I, I think this is another thing. Well, as you were saying, and I was thinking this when you were talking about the U2, U2, the Me Too movement, um, Leah, and, and what you just said, Leslie, in terms of this, there is, this may have, and I'm not saying this is, but this is just an observation. I think that when you have so many famous people involved with these movements, A, I'm glad that they're using their platform for something for good, okay? For example, a Me Too or whatever. But it may, in a, a sense, have the, oppo the, the opposite effect of people not sympathizing as much because these people are already rich and famous. And not that it's not bad when it happens to a rich and famous person, but the average person starts to think, well, you already have money and whatever. So it's, you can solve your problem, you know? So when these rich and famous people speak out against these things and then become the faces of movement, it's it, not that it's problematic, but it may have less of an effect of, of having people sympathize with things or it could be the uh, complete opposite, where because they're famous, they're doing it. But I'm just making an observation if I'm uh, in terms of I'm wondering if the fact that there are so many people of uh, that are highly visible in the media associated with a lot of things like this waters down the effect. Mm -hmm. let I me think just, it could. Let me just jump Go ahead, in. Dr. The comments are, are flying in the comment section, so... Let me just catch up. Kinte is saying people still voted for Bill Clinton. Uh, Kinte is saying, you know, people don't care unless it affects them. Uh, and Kinte says again, people still support Woody Allen. He is a pedo. So he's also saying we need a clean sweep. Why stop at R. Kelly? And Bobby is saying, I can't read what Bobby has a comment. I can't read it, but it says the internet is worse than TMZ. Yes. That's his comment. Sure. Very, very. Um, but I mean, it, for my part, I mean, I, I can't say that I think we should stop at R. Kelly. I think that R. Kelly is really just the start. I mean, if people can learn from this experience, it's that if we marshal enough resources, even if we don't necessarily do it in a timely way, then then there can be consequences. And I do think that other people who have been doing bad behavior, such as R. Kelly, do need to be concerned. Um, I have heard and read and maybe Tachi can can speak on this since media is in her you know her bailiwick and in her wheelhouse that there's going to be something coming out on michael jackson and something that was going on at the neverland ranch mm -hmm. that's going to be has. next it already yeah. has yeah um but i think there's another something coming out specifically about it and and some other another documentary i heard about somebody else so i'm like when are we going to talk about elvis when are we going to talk about a lot of other stars um i i think that that is coming um, but I also, and this is another issue kind of unrelated, but I also think that maybe there's a reluctance too for maybe within the African-American community to want to demonize R. Kelly because it's taking down another one of our leaders who is black. When you look at what's happening with someone like a Woody Allen, there is no mute Woody Allen movement and everybody in Hollywood seems to still break their neck to want to work with him. So I, I feel like there's, there's a lot of double standards too. Like still people are upset about, um, you know, the prosecution and conviction of Bill Cosby because he was a beloved figure in the African-American community. People are heartsick over it. Does he deserve to be where he is? Yes, he does. I mean, he committed those crimes, but I think that there's this sort of heart sickness and people are feeling a way about the fact that we are taking down our African-American leaders and that's only where the microscope lies. It never seems to go the same way with white prominent figures who are doing the same things. They seem to escape it. So I feel like there still seems to be like a racial element that we feel and we see it happening and playing itself out. It doesn't mean that those people shouldn't be prosecuted. Of course they should because they've made, they've done the crime, but I still feel like there is a double standard in terms of the punishment. And I think that some black people feel that way. And I agree that, that that absolutely is. I mean, when you look, go back and look at Bill Cosby, you know, there are two questions there. And Dr. Dr. Vibe, you did a conversation on this. There are two questions there. One thing is the equal treatment under the law. And that's something that we don't see in cases when it is usually people of color, particularly black people. However, the danger here is you're mixing two different things which don't necessarily um, uh, fit together. Well, they fit, 
but they're they're not the same thing because this is why then because we don't want to take down black leaders because then we bring in the thing of oh well if he was white but you're ignoring the issue of something was done wrong and we're ignoring the victims uh, uh rights and the victims issues in this case when we keep leaning on we don't want to take down black men because they're or black people because they're already uh, denigrated in society. And so the alternative is let black people run rampant uh, in, in terms of uh, who do these types of things in terms of what they want to do. No, we have to we have to stop that. So, Leah, I 100 percent agree and see what you're saying, but we're leaning on it as a crutch. So my thing is yes. this. If if you if you don't want to be prosecuted for these types of things, stop don't doing do it crimes. because we exactly. keep getting away with it because we have this. The black people are going to sympathize with your plight as a black person, and they're not going to mm -hmm. do anything. We, we're, I'm tired of us leaning on that. We can't be healthy until the entire community is healthy. Exactly. Where is and clear where is accountability ahead, and responsibility? Sorry, sorry, Leah. What, where is mm -hmm. accountability and responsibility in this? I, I mm -hmm. want I, I have I have to understand that I have to understand where is accountability and responsibility mm -hmm. outlying all the other issues systemic issues power privilege whiteness where is accountability and um, responsibility in this yeah that is a good question um, and the only thing that I want to say before we address your question is that I was just putting out a perspective that I heard, I wasn't putting it out as my own opinion because I don't really have that issue. I feel like if you did the crime, you do the time. I don't give a damn what your race is. So to me, I don't care if it's a Bill Cosby or a Harvey Weinstein or Woody Allen or R. Kelly, they can all go to jail for, our, for all I care for the things that they have done. But just making that clear. But going to um, Leslie's point about accountability and responsibility, I feel like that's exactly what this documentary is trying to do. I think it's trying to put responsibility on people who were there, people who can speak to the crimes, who were a witness to it, who helped him do it, because there's no way that he could have done it by himself on the scale that he did it, speaking specifically of R. Kelly's case. They're clearly enablers who have seen things and know things that could be done to possibly really prosecute him in a meaningful way. Um, and I feel like that's where some of the responsibility lies. They need to feel unafraid to come forward and, and do the right thing. Um, and I really don't understand why why they haven't, you know, over the years. It's the money, it could be the fame, it could be they don't really care. I mean, there's a variety of issues, but I feel like now it's out there. So your name is associated with it. So do something right. Try to, you know, you're never going to be clear of it. You'll always have it on your conscience because you knew that what he was doing was wrong and you helped him to do it. But you I have a chance a to try to do right for these people, for these victims. You, I think there's a code too. You know, there's all sorts of there's the spiral of silence. I think there's this bro code. I think there's a, a, a no snitch code. I think all of those things come into play when when this when this happened, when things like this happen, particularly in you know our community. And besides the fact of not wanting to take someone else down, it's also easier not to say anything and not to get involved because most people don't want to take personal responsibility for things that go wrong that just involves you and that's because um in this society especially we tend to be very individualistic we know about the collectivism uh, versus mm -hmm. individualism and when you think about the good of the society of the society or the community above your own good that means that you have to do things like uh call people out who are doing things wrong. But when you think with an individualistic mindset, which this country is an individualistic country, it's you and yours and that's it. You think about, prison, well, I don't want to get involved because I can't. That's why it's so hard often to get masses of people involved in some things because of the individualism we have here. And that's just a cultural thing. Not that it's right, but that's what it is. And there's a gravy train. There must be, everybody's on that gravy train. And if one yes. person goes down, that gravy train is done. And so there's no, there's no, le again, accountability. There's no accountability because they're all being paid to stay around and shut up. You don't think some of these guys knew? Of course they knew. They all knew they were helping him. Right, right. And because, so, I mean, if you heard the way in, he, in which he preyed upon the, the girls, because they were girls, he would make the initial co you know connection. He'd have eye contact, have a little conversation, totally innocent because they're public. And one of his enablers would circle back around to the girl and give the girl R. Kelly's number or take the girl's number for R. Kelly. It wasn't necessarily him doing it directly. It was through these intermediaries, through his, his goons, and through his whatever, Tati. that would do it. So Very predatory. accountability right there. It's predatorial. It's absolutely and utterly predatorial. In, in every way and, and organized. I, I, so I'm, I'm just going to jump on. 
I'm just going to jump in for a minute. And really, I shouldn't even visually be here because you ladies are doing an outstanding job. Just going to get some <laughs> comments here. You uh, foresight for you too. He said a comment here saying many black people are still afraid to get into a room and work out their own problems. Yeah. Just a thought. And uh, let's see. And uh, Melvin Lars is saying, yes, it is sad. We must see ourselves as people of possibilities instead of liabilities. And the love of money does makes people do very strange things. So you ladies can go ahead. I'm just I'm just filling in. Like I said at the beginning of the conversation, I'm the low person on the to totem pole tonight. So I'm just I'm just hanging out. Well, I wanted to share also a comment that I see Curtis make. And I know Tachi, I heard that sigh again, so I know she has something real good to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, Curtis said, and I want to make this point because I, I agree with it. And this goes to a point that Dr. Tachi made earlier and that I said at the very top of the program and in other programs past that overall, many people of color are asking for a justice system that works the same for both blacks and whites. And and that is, I mean, that would be the ultimate goal because um, then the racial question would be taken out of the equation. And the, the, the argument that I made earlier, though it's not my own argument, it is an argument that I've heard, would also be negated because we just feel like, okay, if you've done the crime, you're going to do the time, or at a minimum, you're going to at least be prosecuted for those crimes, and your race will have nothing to do with the outcome or the way in which you are treated in the trial, and it won't have anything to do with the way in which you're prosecuted or your sentence, because we all know in the United States, and I don't know, maybe our Canadians can, can chime in on this, that sentencing is vastly skewed in the United States depending on who the, the person is. <laughs> the the person who did the crime Leslie, is. Do you want do you want to respond to that? So, Leslie, or do you want me? <laughs> uh, go for it, Doctor Five. Go for it. <laughs> I, get, I mean, it's the um, same here on a smaller scale. We we all there's an old song I think it was by Boogie Down Productions called "We All in the Same Gang." We all in the same gang. Okay, I, just, That's, I, I understand. That. But I, I, okay. I, I, I but I get the feeling from here there's a little more accountability. There, it's so mm -hmm. divisive, and it's based on the systems. I work for an American university. It's it's based on divisive systems there. And it is to some extent here as well, but I feel like there's a little more accountability because we live in a semi-socialist country and more collectivist ideology, right? Yeah. And yeah. so yeah. there's accountability in that. Of course, we have problems here. I mean, it makes like, we all know Canada is amazing, but um, the bottom yes. line is <laughs> it has its own issues, right? Yeah, and, right. And yeah. They're, they're always similar. They're similar threads. Uh, Absolutely. But I get there's a feeling of accountability, a little more accountability here. I don't know if Dr. Vibe could say the same thing. I would say that. I, I would agree to that. That I, I'm glad I'm here. That's all I'm going to say. And I'll leave it at that. So I think there is a little bit more accountability. Yes, we do have racial challenges here. Very much so. And in some ways, we need to get to the vocal and what's the word I'm looking for? Activist sentiments that exist in the United States, but I don't think we're working from a starting point as far back as what's going on in the United States. Well, we're such activists because there's so many damn problems here. I mean, <laughs> the activism is coming from someplace, and I'm, that's not to say that this place is, is like completely terrible. That's not what I'm saying, but right. uh, activism and uh, protest comes from someplace. That's because there are problems here. There are here and with, too, with and, all, yeah. right exactly and with due respect more power to you guys like hey i i and i deep deep admiration yeah. a deep admiration for that right because mm. if you don't protest mm -hmm. nobody hears you right sometimes they don't hear you even when you do protest uh, yeah. 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 understood yeah curtis is saying many blacks believe oj was guilty but people of color have been so abused the same legal the same legal system is supposed to protect us so it is almost refreshing to see him and his legal system circumvent the system that you know what i think we need to have a conversation about the legal system and people of color mm. i think we need to have a separate because this is yeah. more but speaking about this incident it's more that's out in the media world i think a conversation about the justice system and people of color would be a great yeah. conversation piece especially contrasting if we can get everyone back on what goes on in the united states what goes on in canada and compare and see what goes on because we have challenges where uh, people of well, blacks have been shot and killed by the police and there's no justification, etc. Those happen here too. Yeah, but it's so brazen. Yeah. In the United States, it's just brazen. You're walking down the street or you're walking in a park and somebody shoots an unarmed black man. I mean, 
How? I, I, every time I hear this, I just like, my mouth hangs open. How? How? Unheard. Blue code. <laughs> yep. 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 We're at the stage where you can't do anything while black and it could cost you your life right. in right. the United States. And it is frightening. Um, and we, we started to have this conversation in, in, in the past where I was saying, I said at the very top of the program that my day job is, you know, as a diplomat and I work overseas. And I was saying in a previous program that I honestly feel raising my young black son, he's safer overseas right now than he is in his home country because of that very thing. I've said it before and I'll say it again. I really feel that to my core. And this is all, you know, before the current administration was in the White House, I felt this under Obama too, because this stuff, let's just be frank, this stuff has been happening always Hundreds. it's just now now with these body cams and everybody's out with their phones it's now more in the public eye so broader society global society is now seeing what black people have always known to be the truth so and you're yeah. seeing things as innocuous as grilling in the backyard or going into your own house suddenly you're dead because someone thought you weren't supposed to be there so leah Aaron has a very interesting question. What country, what country is he safer in? So tell some of the countries. Anywhere, yeah. <laughs> anywhere <laughs> other than here. But, um, but I mean, for instance, to be specific, um, I just was overseas in, in a country in Latin America. I was in Bolivia and I knew that if I ever had any interaction with the police there, that at worst, I might have to pay a bribe or a little bit of a fine or something like that. But I knew that I would walk away to tell the tale. And I knew that my children would be fine. Um, you know, they would go through the experience, they would see how, you know, mommy and daddy reacted to the situation and they would have a model for how they should interact with the police, which is respectfully just do the best you can and get through it. Um, but here, here as in the United States, I mean, we've seen, like I was saying just a moment ago, any little thing and suddenly everybody wants to call the cops on you or if the police show up, it's shoot first and ask questions later and with no justice later on so for me as a mother raising black children especially a black boy who is you know on the hit list you know he's he's the most scariest individual in the united states apparently above immigrants um i cannot protect him and as a mother that feeling is the most frightening feeling i think i can ever express to feel because there is nothing i can do to protect my son there is nothing that i can do to prepare him there is nothing that no knowledge, no experience, nothing that I can do that will guarantee that he lives to tell the tale if he ever interacts with a policeman. And he doesn't have to be from the inner city to get stopped. He doesn't have to be super rich and in a neighborhood where people don't think he belongs. He could do something as innocuous as walking out of a store or fitting a description and he could die for that. And I can't live with that. As a mom, I just can't. So for now, you know, Aaron, I, I'm not, I don't mean to make light of the situation, but I really do feel like in most other parts of the world, even though yes, we'll face racism and marginalization and all of those things like we do elsewhere, he's safer. Mm. He's safer. He is. And Aaron is. Safe. And it's sad to say, it's sad to say, because this is my home. My I'm American. I, I love my country. I mean, that's where I'm from. That's where my family is, my best friends. It's the country that's made me who I am. But as a mom, I'm gonna do what I need to do to protect my child. And that might mean not living here for a while until I know he's old enough to handle himself, but even then it doesn't guarantee his safety because he could be completely compliant and be still killed. And in most cases that we've seen in, in, in the internet and media, they have been completely compliant and they still die. They're being killed in front of their babies, killed in front of their wives and, and loved ones. Like there's nothing that you can do, literally nothing you can do to avoid being killed because you're perceived as dangerous, you're perceived as a threat because you're male and you're black, period. And it's interesting. I've got comments coming all over the place. A uh, gentleman wants to come on and talk about another subject in relationship to this because you ladies are on fire. That's why. <laughs> <laughs> it's because we got Leslie in there. You yes, know, exactly. it is, uh, you know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Look, Les, this is Leslie calm. <laughs> oh man, so no, she got that spice. I'm listening. I'm learning. I'm learning. New to this format. <laughs> No, We're learning from not, you too. Absolutely. Le Les Leslie is a very, very passionate lady. And I mean that. And that's why we awesome. automatically like her. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Right. absolutely. She don't, she don't play. <laughs> no she play. don't play. Leslie don't play. I, I've seen then her. Then she's in good company. Yes. Exactly. I, I, I've seen Leslie give verbal beatdowns and people just sort of run. Yeah. <laughs> I like it. So yeah. she don't play. Uh, wow. I know that we've gone on for a bit. I know, Tach, you did a conversation earlier, so I don't want to keep us on too long because you've had a long day. 
So what I'm going to ask is just um, final comments from each one of you and where people can reach out and contact you at. So I'm going to get the real newbie to give her comments first, Miss Leslie, and where ah. can people touch base with you? Oh, you mean in terms of email? Is that how you guys do it? Email, social whatever, media? Whatever, whatever I'm your on website. I'm on, fa I'm on Facebook as Leslie F. I can write it down. And I can write it down in the, in the box. I'm Please on do. Instagram as Dr. Yaffa. Um, and, um, two doctors. Uh, two doctors. and, um, I, and I'll, I'll, I'll write down my, I'll write down my email address cause it may be a little too complicated. So, um, yeah. So please get a hold of me. Last words. I'm thank you ladies for always educating me. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I love the conversation. I love talking circles. I love, um, that reciprocity and, and let's talk, let's keep talking. If we don't talk, then people have won. I think people win. Mm, good point. Good point. Dr. Tachi. Yes. So you can reach me uh, everywhere. I do Mediascope every Wednesday, 6 p.m. Eastern time on Periscope, Twitter, Facebook Live, and WJMSRadio.com. Um, nice. you, um, I'm also, uh, the co-host of T the TV channeling podcast, which is on all major podcasting platforms. In addition to WJMSRadio.com on Tuesdays, you can reach me at, I am at Tachiada, T-A-C-H-I-A-D-A -A -A, on Twitter and on Periscope. You can reach me on Mediascope at Mediascope16 wow. on, <laughs> on, um, impressive. Uh, no, thank you. <laughs> on um, <laughs> Facebook and it's some form of do on, on, on Instagram. I am Dr. Underscore Tachi. So usually some form of Tachi or Tachiata, you can find me. Well, nice. the, lady, the lady who brought this topic, who brought, who's, who led the heat tonight. Oh, Ms. wait a minute. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Can uh -huh. I get my, I, 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 yes, I'm about finish, to finish. I was about to say that's not all. I know that's I'm not sorry. all. I'm sorry. I apologize. I forgot to do uh, the final thoughts. Um, it, it's time for action. We've been making excuses for why all these things have existed for too long. At this particular point, I don't give a damn that, um, for example, somebody like R. Kelly was abused. Fine. I understand that was the case, but you don't have an excuse for staying ignorant. You can be ignorant, but staying ignorant is a crime. So at some point you have to uh, want to uh, change enough and you have to care enough about your own evolution to change. If you don't, we'll change your mind for you. So uh, it's, it's time for the excuses to be over. We do. I agree with Leslie. We do need to keep having these conversations, but I need to see action. Stop. We have to stop making excuses for our deplorable behavior. Yeah. Um, I'll give my final thought first just so we can have all that good stuff out there and give the ladies time to put their stuff in the comments too. I feel the same way as both of the ladies have already expressed that we have momentum now. We are The doors are opening and walls are coming down for conversations about this type of topic. It should not be taboo. And I kind of want to bring it back to supporting the victims and hearing their voices and, and providing advocacy for them and stop victim shaming and blaming. I'm sick of that. I agree with Tachi that I'm tired of this. It's about time that we take action. Use the platforms that we have, use our voices, talk about the issues, remove the taboo feelings about it and call call it what it is. Abuse is abuse. I don't care what form it comes in. I don't care who it, who's the abuser. Um, victims' voices matter, their perspectives matter and we need to believe them. That's it. Um, and like I said before, there are a lot of peripheral issues and all of these problems are always multi-layered and multifaceted. But at the end of the day, if you've done the crime, I want you to to, to do the time. Um, you've destroyed people's lives and that's the least that you can do. Um, and I think that we need to, as Leslie was saying earlier, make people take accountability and take responsibility for the things that they have done, negative or positive, I don't care. So it's up to us to do it. Um, and you know, if you hear nothing else from us tonight, then you just need to hear that, lift your voice. There are resources out there for you victims. People are listening. Um, you have an important thing to say and we're ready to hear it. Um, and people who are out there doing wrong, your time is coming. Amazing. That's what I think. All right. Well done. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not going to add too much. Wait, she that. forgot to give her. Um, oh, I yes, forgot to give my little yes, stuff. Yes. All right. So I posted my stuff in the comments. So just to make it easier, everybody can go there. But I said in the beginning that I'm a writer, a blogger, freelancer. You can see me once a month in Griot's Republic magazine. It's an urban travel magazine. Um, my most recent article um, was talking about a 
a cycling club in South Africa in the um, one of the um, towns just outside of Cape Town um, uh, about a guy who's only 27 years old, who's a social entrepreneur who created this cycling club and it's actually become, it's producing world-class cyclists for the first time um, in a sport that has traditionally not been very pepper. Um, let's just put it like that. Um, and he's doing so much more. So I wrote about that and I have a lot more stuff coming out. My most recent publication came out last week in Ink Stick Media and it's basically a you know work-life balance article. Nice. Um, and you can see that there. I have a piece that's gonna come out soon on a feminist website, which I will post once it's out. And I'm working on a bunch of other things. But if you, yeah, exactly, Curtis Pepper. I'm trying to be nice. Um, but if you want to keep in touch with me or reach out or see what I'm doing, you can find me pretty much at Leah World Travelers across social media. That's L-I-A World Traveler, T-R-A-V-E-L-E-R. -E um, the only place where my social media handle is different is on Twitter. It's Leah World, World Travels with an S. But you can go back to the comments to see it. And if you go to any one of my platforms, the rest of them are all connected. So thank you. I hope to connect with you more. Leah, come to Jamaica. Wow. Come to Jamaica. I'd <laughs> love to. To do a blog. Yes, bring me on. I'll, I'll I want you to give a talk. Social services down there. You're a social worker. I'd love to. Yes, come yes, I am. Come on down. I'll be there. Believe me, I'm looking for a new day job right now. They're not oh, making it easy for us just out here, so. <laughs> Leah. Come on. Come on down. I've got a house. Everybody, I've got a house down in Jamaica. I, I can say that. Faculty house. Come on down. Yes. Let me know. You got my okay. email and information now, Leslie. Exactly. Okay. exactly. Hook it up. Hook it up. So as a as a good host, what I'm going to do is offline. I'm going to make sure that all these ladies have each other's contact information so they can interact. And uh, Tachi knows I'm like that. So before I go to bed tonight, well, you know what? I don't have Leslie's email address. I only have the Facebook thing. So you have my Instagram. I, 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 you have my Instagram too. Yeah, but I. Oh, you're so you're so difficult. <laughs> I'm so good right. at self promoting. You guys are so good at this. You guys got to teach me. This is so good. Okay, I'm like wow. No problem. So, Leslie, I'm gonna Hold give on. you my email address right here in the comment section, and I want you to send me your email address. Unless it is it still the same one from years ago? There was an edu. Yeah, I'm still an address. edu. That that that's there. I, I'm gonna. I'll send you my private one as well. Sure. Yes. Yeah, so there's my you email address. My Instagram as well. Uh, no, forget just email. You seem to have this block about email. I don't know what it is, but that's another story. It's Dr. Vibe, your host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. If you want to catch uh, epic replays of these type of conversations, go to my YouTube channel and go to the search engine, put in the space, DR period space, V-I-B-E space, S-H-O-W. You'll catch about 500 conversations. If you want to catch audio replays, you go to my website, the DR, V-I-B-E, S-H-O-W.com. There's iTunes, no iTunes, there's Apple Podcasts, iHeartRadio, Tuned In Radio, Google Play Music Store, Stitcher Radio, Selected Audio Replays. Leslie's going to think I'm going on too long. Selected Audio Replays, GoodMenProject.com, WJMS Radio out of New York. Well, Jamie don't like me anymore. She She's a fan of Tachi, so I'm second fiddle now. <laughs> and, and, uh, so I had to get another platform, Mile High Radio out of Denver, Colorado. <laughs> We also, I'm a certified empowerment coach, president CEO of Express Your Vibe Coaching and Communications. If you want to reach out to me with that, email me at dr. Which the email address is there. Twitter is at drvibeshow. There's some other things, but I'm going to just like fade it out. But Dr. Vibe is going to be doing some appearances next month uh, in Canada. Uh, February 2nd, I'm on a panel at the in Toronto, the harbor front. Uh, for the Black Love Symposium, I'll be sitting on a panel about Black fathers loving their Black sons. Nice. So that's February 2nd. The next day, I'm in Ottawa hosting a media uh, media open town hall at the National Black Summit. And then at the end of February, I'm uh, hosting a panel discussion at a National Fatherhood Conference in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada. So I'm trying to keep up to the ladies here, so I'm doing the best I can. I'll stop it, Leslie, with what well, I got. I'm just amazed by all these women who are great. Wow. And you, Dr. Vibe. Yeah. Well, I, like I said, I, I'm, I'm just there. So as always, I like to say uh, you're blessed and highly favored. You're a magnet for miracles and you're a solution for someone's problem. Remember that live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. And finally, block assumptions. And especially after this conversation, you need to block assumptions. And... I saw something that Leslie says a lot of times, walk good. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, Bob, I could go through everybody, but you know, I might as well. 
It was uh, Bobby, Aaron, uh, who else? Kinte. Oh, some other. I just trying to keep up. I think that's so so staff. Curtis. Uh, on the YouTube end, there was uh, Melvin and you, Foresight, for you too. And a big thank you to all these ladies here in the live conversation. I I had some challenges, and they, they didn't need me, really and truly. They didn't need me. And to be honest, this is the way I like conversation to go. I just steer the ship. They drove the ship tonight. So you need to keep in touch for all these ladies because they're making positive things happen. And I'm honored to know each one of them. So everyone else, have a good night. If you want to stay on for a few moments, we're going to do a little bit of an after chat. But God bless. Peace and well. Keep the faith. Tomorrow night, I have Karen Dawson talking about how to be a better public speaker. Hmm. It's a very important topic. Whether And she's not just how to be a better speaker, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in front of a group of people. Uh, Karen has been doing this world class wise for about 10, 15 years. And believe it or not, we haven't seen each other for 10 years. And we're back together again tomorrow night at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. God bless. Peace be well. Keep the faith. And again, walk good. Bye, guys.